Welcome back anatomy students. We are on the respiratory system which is unit 12. You'll notice that we skipped unit 11 on the endocrine system. So we're on pages 181 and 182 and again those are the terms in the green boxes that you will be responsible for. You'll have lab pages due in one week on April 27th page 189 to 190 and then I'll open up your quiz at 8 a.m. on Monday April 27th. I'll briefly go over some of the lecture material that you guys might get in lecture. Um, general organization and functions of the respiratory system. We divide your respiratory system into an upper and a lower respiratory tract and we functionally divide it into a conducting portion where only air transport occurs and a respiratory portion where gas exchange occurs. Your respiratory system performs inhalation and exhalation, as well as gas exchange, and we call the external respiration exchanges gases between the atmosphere and the blood, and internal respiration exchanges gases between the blood and the body cells. More functions of your respiratory system. It conditions the gas by warming, humidifying, and cleaning the air. It produces sound in your larynx, it helps with olfaction or the sense of smell, and it helps to protect against airborne pathogens that you might breathe in. So we'll start with your upper respiratory tract, which includes your nose, your nasal cavities, um, your paranasal sinuses, and your pharynx, which is your throat. The nose is the main conducting airway for inhaled air. Um, there's a little bit more here in the nasal cavity. Uh, your nasal bones form the bridge of your nose. You have kind of this fleshy cartilaginous dorsum which we all have different shapes of and then the nasal cavity will be right behind the entrance to the nose. You can see here your nasal cavity is aligned with um, pseudostratified epithelium. Your nasal septum divides the nasal cavity into right and left portions and then you have concha which form the lateral wall for each cavity. They're ridges that come out on the lateral wall. You have a superior, middle, and inferior nasal concha. And beneath each nasal concha, there's an air passageway, and we call the air passageway a meatus. And I'll show you a picture of that here. So here is your pharynx picture on the bottom, first of all. You can see how we divide it into the nasopharynx, the area behind the nasal cavity, the oropharynx is behind the oral cavity, and the laryngopharynx is behind the larynx. And this picture shows a little more anatomy about those concha, which are bony, fleshy ridges that form the lateral walls of your nasal cavity. The superior nasal concha is the one at the top, the middle nasal concha is in the middle, and the inferior nasal concha is the one at the bottom. And then in the nasal cavity, right below those concha, you have your meatus. The superior meatus is the air passageway right below the superior nasal concha. The middle meatus is below the middle nasal concha, and the inferior meatus is below the inferior nasal concha. Above the nasal cavity, you can see those paranasal sinuses, your frontal sinus within the frontal bone and the sphenoidal sinus in the spinal bo sphenoid bone. And again, those are spaces within their skull bones. You can see your air pharynx there and divided into the three categories. Uh, right behind your nasal cavity, you can see your pharyngeal tonsils. And in the back of your oral cavity, I don't think they're listed, oh, they are. You have your palatine tonsils in the back of the oral cavity. And then within the larynx, we have your epiglottis and some pieces of cartilage, which we'll go into detail more. So here are the sinuses. Again, the ones that you're responsible for will just be the frontal and the spinoidal sinus. They make the bones lighter in weight, and they're named after the bones in which they reside. Here's a look at the sinuses and where they're located within the skull. Then here's your pharynx and the three regions that it's divided into. Again, the nasopharynx is behind the nasal cavity, oropharynx behind the oral cavity, and the laryngopharynx behind the larynx. Here is your nasopharynx. It's right posterior to your nasal cavity and superior to your soft palate. Within your nasopharynx, we have openings of your auditory tubes. 
And the auditory tubes will be will help with equalizing pressure when you go up in an airplane or up into the mountains um, between the pressure differences between your nasal cavity and within your ear. Posterior nasopharynx houses one single pharyngeal tonsil, and we call those the adenoids. The oral pharynx then is right behind your oral cavity. Uh, you have two pair of muscular arches on the lateral walls, and the palatine tonsils are embedded in those lateral walls between the arches. Then the laryngopharynx starts right below your hyoid bone and extends to the top of your esophagus. And again, this is the part of the throat um, that's right behind your larynx. Here's a look at the three regions of the pharynx and their functions and their characteristics of each. Then we'll get into the lower respiratory tract. Um, it contains conducting portions and respiratory portions, which you guys will learn about in lecture. Here are the different structures of the lower respiratory tract, and we'll get into a picture soon, I promise. We'll start with the larynx, commonly known as the voice box. It connects your pharynx to your trachea. It serves as a passageway for air. It helps to present, prevent anything that you eat or anything that gets ingested from entering your respiratory tract. It produces sound and it assists in increasing pressure in your abdominal cavity, both for sneezing and coughing. It's supported by a framework of nine cartilages held in place by ligaments. The thyroid cartilage is the largest of the cartilage. And I'll show you a picture of that. Its V-shaped anterior projection is called the laryngeal prominence or the Adam's apple. Testosterone causes males' Adam's apples to be more prominent. There's a ring-shaped cricoid cartilage right below your thyroid cartilage. The epiglottis will be the little spoon-shaped cartilage projecting superiorly. When you swallow, the epiglottis closes over the larynx so food does not go down your trachea. And there's other small paired cartilages to help with sound production, as you can see there. The only one that you guys need to be familiar with, um, besides the cricoid and the thyroid cartilage, is the arytenoid cartilage. And again, I'll show you a picture of here coming up. So here is the larynx. Um, an anterior view of the larynx is shown in letter A. You can see the thyroid cartilage is the largest of the cartilages. The epiglottis is that little tongue-shaped structure that will close over the larynx to prevent food from going down your trachea when you swallow. The cricoid cartilage is right below the thyroid cartilage. And then the arytenoid cartilage is kind of hidden here um, behind some of these muscles, but you can see the arytenoid cartilage um, is right kind of in between the thyroid and cricoid cartilages there. The vocal folds are found in your larynx and they're comprised of vocal ligaments covered by a mucous membrane. The opening between your vocal folds is called the rima glottidis. I think that's one of your questions on your lab pages. Uh, the glottis consists of both the focal folds and then that rima. When air is forced through the rima, it causes vibration of the vocal folds, resulting in sound. And you can see there how vocal range, pitch, and loudness um, will depend on the length, thickness, and tension of the vocal folds. The longer the vocal fold, the lower the voice. So again, testosterone causes... Um, in puberty, males' vocal cords to increase in length, and that's what causes their voices to drop. So here are vocal folds. You can see the rima glottidis is the space in between, or the, just the glottis. You could also call it, um, a, which is what's listed on your page 181. Then you have your vestibular folds, also known as the false vocal folds, and then the vocal folds folds themselves are known as the true vocal cords or vocal folds. The trachea then is commonly referred to as the windpipe. It connects the larynx. It's right in front of the esophagus and it's supported by C-shaped cartilaginous rings. And you can feel those cartilaginous rings again if you um, feel the anterior side of your neck. 
So here's a look at your trachea and how it's right below your larynx, right below that thyroid and cricoid cartilage. Your trachea is again the windpipe that'll be constantly held open so that air can go into your lungs. The trachea is right in front of your esophagus so that when you do swallow food, your epiglottis closes over your larynx so that food will go down back in the esophagus. Here's a look at your trachea and then how it will split in letter C at a place we call the carina. And at the carina, it'll split into a right and left main bronchi. So at the level of the sternal angle, your trachea will split into, the, into what we call primary bronchi. So primary bronchi are the first splitting of the trachea. Continued splitting leads to progressively smaller tubes into what we call secondary and tertiary bronchi. And you can see these listed here. You can see your larynx, the trachea coming down, the right and left primary bronchi, and then the lobar branches and segmental branches. Again, the lobar branches would be secondary bronchi and segmental branches would be tertiary bronchi. So basically your trachea just splits into smaller and smaller pieces to get air to every part of the lungs. So your bronchial tree, many levels of branching occur. I'm gonna continue past this slide. The bronchi branch into smaller and smaller tubes and then they eventually branch into what we call bronchioles, which can be um, controlled by your nervous system. Terminal bronchioles branch into respiratory bronchioles, which eventually um, end in what we called alveolar ducts and alveolar sacs. And all of these outpocketings we call alveoli. And you can see a picture of this on page 183. The alveoli, the wall of the alveoli, is where gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide, will diffuse between the blood and the air in the lungs. And you can see here the bronchioles branches from the pulmonary artery and pulmonary veins coming into the alveoles, bringing air to the alveoles and showing where gas exchange between carbon dioxide and oxygen will occur. If we look into the gross anatomy of the lungs, each lung is conical in shape. It has a broad inferior base resting on the diaphragm and an appointed superior apex. Uh, the lung's costal surface connects contacts ribs, and the mediastinal surface faces the medially to each other. This surface houses a concave region called the hilum, and the root of the lung is what enters at the hilum, and that will consist of the bronchi, pulmonary vesicles, lymphatic vessels, and any nerves going into and out of the lung. So here's a look at the gross anatomy of the lung itself. You can see the apex, the superior lobe, um, and then the different lobes itself of the, lo the lung. You can see the cardiac notch is the space within the left lung, which will leave space for the heart to sit. And the cardiac impression is within that. And I'll show you another medial view of this. So you notice here the right lung has three lobes to it, the superior, middle, and inferior lobe. And the left lung just has a superior and inferior lobe to it. It's smaller because it needs to leave space for the heart, which will sit within that cardiac notch. Here's a medial view of the gross anatomy of the lungs. You can see the cardiac notch and the cardiac impression on the left lung, which is where the heart will sit. You can also see the area called the hilum, and that's where all the blood vessels, bronchioles, will enter and exit out of the lung. You'll notice that within this hilum, the pulmonary artery is in blue and the pulmonary veins are in red. And this will be the only time in the body where you'll see arteries as blue and veins as red. And that's because the pulmonary arteries are taking blood away from the heart that's deoxygenated. And the pulmonary veins are bringing blood back to the heart as oxygenated, so they will be in red. The left lung is slightly smaller. It has that cardiac impression and cardiac notch with the superior and inferior lobes, and the right lung has the superior middle and inferior lobes. We'll look at the segments of each lung here. 
and the segments just correspond to each branch of the bronchioles that reach out to it. Pulmonary circulation conducts blood to and from the gas exchange surface to the lungs, and bronchial circulation is part of systemic circulation. Before we end here, I kind of always talk about smoking just a little bit. You can see how um, when you smoke, the smoking will actually change the lining of your trachea so it's, you're not able to trap all the harmful things you're smoking in. So instead, they blacken up and get to your lungs very black. Um, so smoking, please try to stop smoking. The last thing I'll say that we didn't cover yet is the pleura. The pleura, parietal, and viscer have to do with layers of the lung. The parietal pleura of the lungs will be the outermost layer of the lungs that are in contact with the body wall. And the visceral pleura is the layer of the lungs that's in direct contact with the lungs. And that's all for this lecture. I hope you guys are doing healthy and well. Take care.